Shabbat Shalom everyone! Welcome to Congregation Yeshiva Torah Studies and this week's Torah portion is a double portion, Matot, which means tribes, and Masay, which means journeys. If you're new to the channel, we are a Messianic congregation uh, based in Mississauga, Ontario, Canada, and uh, we will be meeting soon, and if we do, we will be at the Paramount Fine Food Center uh, for um, services start date. Please uh, send us an email if you're interested to join us, or send us a text or give us a call. And if you haven't read this book, I encourage you to read this book. It's an end time book. It will open your eyes to why we need to go back to our Jewish roots, because uh, at the end of it, we will serve a Jewish king. He's the king of kings and the lord of lords. Our Torah portion is double portion taken from Numbers chapter 30 verse 2 to chapter 36 verse 13. And I'd like to read the introduction to the uh, Torah portion from the Arch Scroll Kumash, page 900. It says here, it says, Vows and Oaths. The Torah introduces a chapter which upon reflection gives a person the right to do something that heretofore could be done only by God, that is, to create a new halakhic status by pronouncing the sort of vow or oath sent forth in this passage, a person is given the power to invoke a nether, i.e. a vow or oath, thereby placing upon himself or the others or upon objects of his choice a status equivalent to that of the commandments of the Torah. This neder is so strong that a person violating it, it can suffer the court-imposed penalty of lashes. It must be understood that there is no English equivalent for the word neder. For the lack of anything closer, it is commonly referred to as a vow, a word that means a pledge to do something. A simple pledge, however, uh, though a Jewish must, must, must keep this word, is, not, uh, is very important. And uh, I'd like to read the introduction to the Torah portion, uh, Masay, again in the Archkor Kumash, this time in page 918. In this chapter... The Torah summarizes the entire route followed by Israel from Exodus until they stood poised to cross the Jordan to enter the Promised Land. The list of journeys emphasizes God's compassion because it shows that notwithstanding the decree that they wander in the wilderness for 40 years, the people enjoyed extended periods of rest. In all, there were 42 encampments the first 14 of which were before the mission of the spies uh, from Rimnat. It is called here, see verse 18, and of the last eight encampments, verse 41 to 49, were in the 40th year after Aaron's death. Thus, during the 38 intervening years, there was only 20 journeys, Rashi citing uh, 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 Rabbi Moshe Ha Darshan. It should be noted that several places mentioned in this list are not found in the earlier chapters, presumably because nothing memorable happened there, while the account here is a complete list of all the places where they encamped. Ramban notes that the Torah stresses that God commanded Moses to record these places, verse 2, to intimate that great secrets are contained in those 42 journeys. I thought uh, that was interesting uh, to read. So uh, in, in uh, Numbers chapter 30, verse 2, And Moses spoke to the head of the tribes, Matot, tribes, of the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord had commanded. Well, in the English, it's translated here, the thing. But in the Hebrew, the word there is ha, meaning the, Debar. In other words, the word debar, which means the word, is also referred to as the thing. So why is that important? Why? Because the word also means it is tangible. 
It is a thing. That is, the words we speak things into existence, why we need to guard our speech. This is important because uh, this is another one of those pre precedents as the word became an object. A thing, a flesh, the word also means something tangible, intrinsic in Hebrew. The word became flesh. Yeshua became flesh. The written Torah appeared to become the living Torah. So here in John chapter 1, he's describing the word, the word, the thing. The word in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. See, the interesting is the word was God, but the word was God. And verse 14, and the word became a human being and lived with us. And we saw his Shekinah, the Shekinah or the glory of Father's only son full of grace and truth. I thought that was interesting. In Numbers chapter uh, 3, it says here, when a man makes a vow, a vow unto the Lord, or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeded out of his mouth. So there's two words here talking about the, the, the word uh, nedar, vow, and the Hebrew word for oath is shuba. So what's the difference? So um, in the next slide, it says here, a vow, that is, uh, a vow, nedar, nedar, is, the example is, a vow not to eat grapes. Grapes, which is kosher, becomes unclean to you until the vow ends. So that's the difference between a vow and an oath. In the, in the, in the case of the oath, in the same example, you say you shall not eat grapes. The grapes remain kosher in an oath, but you forbid yourself from eating it. So in Sesia, in both cases, whether it's a nadir or a shuva, you are committing or binding yourself by your words. Now, God's people, the Jews, takes this seriously. Why? Because God takes this, takes his word seriously. If God wants us to keep our vows, then do you think he takes it seriously as well? So taking a vow is not prohibited, but it is very much discouraged. Why? It, it's better to avoid all types of things in life rather than making a vow. Can you make a vow? Yes, absolutely. But you are encouraged, discouraged from doing so. If a person makes a vow, not a, uh, it means he or she is spiritually weak person because they need it to be to be able to be forced into action. An ordinary believer, a follower that that uh, goes about their days and live the Torah life, they are the ones that are spiritually strong and do not need to make vows. He or she knows what is permitted and chooses those in his or her life that is a holy person. The one who has to lock himself away from people, society, and makes vows, they are the ones that are spiritually weak. I guess that's a very good uh, perspective on, on it. Like a brave person is not the one who stays at home. He often goes into battle. So I think that's very important understanding because... Uh, um, we take vow. We, we 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 get into vows ourselves very easily. So here in um, in Numbers again, chapter thirty, it it says here um, there's some some of the rules of the vows. We shall just look at some of them. In verse six, it says here, if um, if a woman makes a vow, verse four, and vow to the Lord and bind herself by a bond, being in her father's house in her youth. And her fathers hear her, hear her vow. So if the father hears her vow and doesn't say anything, the vow stands. But verse 6, but if the father disallows her in that day that he hear it, none of her vows or her bonds wherewith she had bound her soul shall stand, 
but the Lord will forgive her because her father disallowed it. So, so here we see here that the father is intervening in behalf of her unmarried daughter. Now, if she's married to a husband, her vows are upon her and, and verse 7, over her clear utterance, her lips were which she had made, had bound her soul and her husband hear it, were, were whatsoever day it be that she hear it, it and hold his peace at her, then her vow shall stand. So again, if the husband doesn't say anything, he heard what the what his w wife said. But verse 9, but if her husband disallow her on that day that he hear it, then he shall make the vow, her, make void her vow, which is upon her, and the clear utterance of her lips, wherewith she had bound her soul, and the Lord will forgive her. So it's very interesting here because the father... In this case, the father can cancel a vow made by her unmarried daughter and, and also the vow he heard from his wife. If married, if the daughter is married, she, he is no longer under his father's edict but of her husband. The Torah, of course, honors women. The Torah honors women's rights. But now we are seeing a distinction of roles. It's very critical because people can be equal in value, equal in, in their esteem, but we are not necessarily equal in our roles. That is the confusion that the world is having now. Men and women have different roles in life. When men try to be women or women try to be men, that is when we get into trouble. That is why the Torah forbids men to dress like women or wear women's clothes or women to dress like men or men wear men's clothes. So when the husband heard his wife making prohibition upon herself and on that hearing was silent about her, then her vows shall stand and her prohibitions. But on the day of her, the, the, her husband's hearing and he shall revoke his, the vow, the Adonai will forgive her. Why say forgive her? Whether daughter or wife, she made a vow. God will not hold it against her that she that she that she did not just that she did not live up to her vow because the husband or the father nullified it. I think that's a very important point. There, we have we are of equal value, but if we have different roles. So in number chapter thirty again, it talks about uh, not only vows, but it talks about oath. So it says here. Uh, verse 3, when a man vowed a vow unto the Lord or sweared an oath to bind his soul with a, with a bond, he shall not break his word, he shall do according to all that proceeded out of his mouth. So uh, in uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 2 and 3, talking about worldly read leaders, right? It says here, I say, keep the king's commandment for the sake of your oath to God. Do not be hasty to go from his presence. Do not take your stand for an evil thing. Do not take your stand for an evil thing, for he does whatever it pleases him. So in um, one of the sages, Rabbi Nubakya, he says here, Hashem is the ultimate authority in the universe. He lives, he lives, uh, of all the lives of all earthly kings are in his hands and terrestrial powers is only delegated power in order to remind us of this solomon said in ecclesiastes chapter 2 verse 8 i counsel you to obey the king's command in that manner of an oath to god so concerning the whole subject of how we should relate to impose authority, Solomon means that we, he views it as an important, it is important for us to obey the king's laws. As he says, the kings are duty bound to observe the ultimate king's command. Very important insight because many today, they claim they love Hashem, and but they are teaching that Yeshua, who is the king above all kings, along, came along and abolished the Torah, the king's commandments. He abolished the Torah. It is illogical and completely unfounded. There is no scriptural basis in the Bible that says that Yeshua came to nullify, to, to, to replace the law. If you analyze the statement from Rebbeinu Bakya, 
It says here, the king is someone appointed by God to rule the terrestrial universe. The earthly, the earthly king. And the king is someone who must perceive himself duty-bound to observe the Torah. To observe the king of king's commandments. Let us look at this this way. If Hashem appoints a king, in this case the Mashiach, and the Mashiach who is now appointed by God, think about it. He is now the king. Where is his authority originate? From where does his authority to be king originate? The answer is from the Torah itself. The king, the very authority of the king comes from the Torah. Wherefore, if you nullify the Torah, we necessarily nullify the very position that gave him that authority. So it says here, so think about it. So if you abolish the Torah, there can be no Messiah. There, there cannot be a Messiah because there will be no king for Israel. That is what, that is what you know, the, the enemy uh, in World War II was trying to do. He was trying to eliminate the people, Jewish people. Why? If there's no Jewish people, then there is no Messiah that will return to the Jewish people because the position of the kings of Israel was created in the Torah. So if you nullify the Torah, you necessarily nullify the position of the king of Israel. There can't be a king of Israel if there is no Torah because the king of Israel comes from the Torah. Wow. But yet we thought that the king of Israel nullified the Torah. Therefore, if that is true, he nullified the very document that gave him the authority to, to supposed to do what he just did. The example here is in the uh, in the uh, in in many countries the, they have a constitution. The constitution uh, in, you know gives them the power to elect, let's say, a prime minister or president. Now, if you nullify the constitution. If the president or the prime minister nullifies the, the, the constitution, he, he effectively nullifies the office that he is sitting. The, constitu the constitution created the office and therefore you cannot nullify the very thing that created you or your position. So the whole subject of an oath is related to the fear of the, and reverence of the Lord. Man is not supposed to utter the name of the Lord even in an oath which testifies to the truth, much less so in an oath which he perjures himself by using the name of Hashem. The idea here, we're not supposed to, to say vows. In an Orthodox marriage, in a Jewish marriage ceremony, there is no vows. There's, there's lots of reason for that. But the man says to the woman, you are consecrated to me by this ring according to the laws of Moses and Israel. And the woman says, I agree. Then the woman gives her husband the ring and says, This is a symbol of my love and devotion to you. But there are no, there is no, no vows. The main reason is vows are discouraged, not prohibited, but to be avoided. Judaism allows under the Torah law for divorce. So is, is divorce a great thing? No and allowed for various reasons. So if a couple makes a vow and later divorces, it is a problem because you are breaking your vow. So that is why there is no vows in a Jewish wedding. Understand without Torah, there will be no marriage because marriage is the institution granted uh, by the Torah, not by any pagan religion. So... Uh, We'll continue on the theme of oaths in, in Proverbs chapter 24, verse 21 to 22. It says here, My son, fear the Lord and the king, and meddle not with them They are that are given to change. For their calamity shall rise suddenly, and, and, who, and who knoweth the, the ruin from them both. So, Again, uh, Rabbeinu Bakya here in Proverbs chapter 24, verse 21, he's, in his commentary, he says, The fear of the Lord, my son, and the king, uh, fear the Lord, my son, and the king, do not associate with those who keep changing. In this verse, Solomon warns man to fear the Lord Adonai, first and foremost. The fear of mortal king is, is only as, as someone who is subordinate to Adonai. He applies the term Yira, 
the word there, fear and awe, as applicable to man's relationship with a higher authority, be it celestial, which is from above, or terrestrial, which is from below. So there is the here is the message: just as you must fear the Lord, who is who is everywhere at all times, you must also abstain from sin, because you know you are being watched. Although you cannot see the one who watches you, so too you must be in awe of the terrestrial king, even when he is not present, seeing he can decree death upon you, even when he personally has not seen, seen you doing a sin. But God sees everything. We are supposed to fear God because... He, because the king, the government, the legislatures are the are only his subordinates, only his sub or are, are, are only subject to him. They only have the power delegated to them. Yeshua said to Pilate, "You don't have the power." the The basic message of the verse in Proverbs is that fear of terrestrial authority is the the guise of a king. If something absolutely necessary as otherwise earth will be in a state of chaos and anarchy as otherwise uh, the answer to the question why we, we why the forces of darkness right now in the form of Marxist organizations like Antifa and BLM why are they trying to create a state of anarchy in the world trying to defund the police you know, even, uh, uh, you know, uh, July 1st, there was um, Independence Day here in Canada, and they were saying, we should not celebrate that. It's a racist uh, you know, Independence Day. You know, why do they want to, keep, what do, why do they want to um, defund the police? Why? Because their mandate, their mission is to ensure people are not abiding by laws. Why? Because they don't want peace and order. You know, if there is no laws, if there is no police to enforce it, then what do you have? You will have a society that is in anarchy. You absolutely lose your freedom. You will absolutely lose peace and order. The government is an extension of heaven. And the purpose is to prevent chaos and anarchy. This is also why our sages in Abbot 3, chapter 3, verse 2, have instructed us to pray for our the well-being of the government. It's a wrong attitude not to get involved or participate in voting. Uh, Jeremiah says, "Pray for the well-being of your government. If not, if not, this is legally, if, if not this legally appointed authority according to the sages, the world would revert to tohu and bohu." The people would tear each other apart in a daily, on a daily basis. This is why the forces of darkness have wanted anarchy. They wanted to defund the police, etc. Anarchy comes from the pit of hell. The enemy war, it wars against the Torah. So what's happening in the world today is what uh, is taking Torah away from the world. They want a religion that anything goes. They don't want the Torah. The Torah divides all we can do into three categories, as you can see there in the bottom of the screen. The Torah has three categories. Most people think that, that the Torah is only two, thou shalt not and thou shalt. They are uh, what we must do, what we can do or may do, and then what we... Uh, so the third one is there, thou, you, thou shalt, you, you, things that you may do. And um, there are commandments that teach us you cannot do that. There are commandments that teach us you must do that. And there are commandments that teach us that it is permissible if you want to. A good example of that is drinking strong drink. You may drink it. It's not a sin to indulge in it. What is not allowed is to get drunk. The thing that we must do are essential for our fulfillment of our role as bearer of God's messenger on the earth. The things that we may not that that we may do are not essential, but if we can 
but can, if we use properly, can enhance our spiritual lives and fulfillment of our purpose. The things that we must not do are detrimental to our purpose. Under normal circumstances, this aspect of reality cannot be elevated to divine consciousness just by our efforts. In other words, the things that we are not supposed to do, just shall not do, will not give any, it will not it will just be detrimental to our purpose. So, as mentioned earlier, the three categories of Torah uh, or law or commandments on a collective scale, the ability of a Jewish person to elevate certain aspects of this neutral ground, things that we may do, uh, has changed or fluctuated throughout history. When the temple stood, for example, and after it was dis destroyed, and the Jewish exile. This is the reason behind the various rabbinic decrees and prohibitions that have been added to, to the Jewish observance over time. Most of these originated after the loss of the Holy Temple. These rabbinic decrees did not add to the Torah. That's the, that's the confusion there. People think that you know, the Jewish, Jewish people were adding to the Torah, but what, the, what they're trying to do is the people began to lose clarity and so required more insight. Similarly, every individual goes through a period in his life when he is more fit or less fit to indulge in a particular material pleasure. In general, if a person can indulge in a pleasure that God has put in this world for our enjoyment without compromising his divine consciousness, he is encouraged to do so. In the future, every person will be called to account for the pleasure that he has encountered but did not take part of it. So in the future, it says here, in the future, every person will be called to account for the pleasure that he encountered but did not partake of. A little bit of balance. We will, we will be judged for those things we partook that were forbidden, but also judged for, no, for not partaking for those that were permitted but chose not to. Is is that which the Torah forbidden not enough for you? Sage says that you seek to prohibit yourself from other things as well, as, as noted in, in Talmud, Jerusalem 9, verse 5. This is our this is the other crack of the problem. The reason why this is grounds with which we need to walk cautiously, the reason why people forbid things for themselves which are legitimate, acceptable for them to forbid it, but must. But just because you don't want it upon yourself, you cannot impose it on others. Like for there's people that are more susceptible, for example, to alcoholism. So they should, they have made a determination upon themselves not to indulge in alcohol. So that's fine. Uh, but you cannot say that, hey, you know, because I can't do it, you should not be doing it either. So, so Thor forbid this, uh, forbids us. Uh, these things it, uh, it says here now if we, if we forbid things for ourselves on top of that which are normally not forbidden then we are in effect adding to the Torah that is why Yeshua said if you eat bread without washing hands that is fine nowhere in the gospel where Yeshua rebuked the rabbinic enactment including hand washing the problem he was addressing is when you say, if you do not wash your hands, that the bread has become forbidden to you or defiled to you because there's no such mandate in the Torah. So when a, when a person sees a particular indulgence and it affects him negatively, he should at least renounce it temporarily. If he feels he's incapable of res resisting the urge to overindulge, he can make a formal bow which, for, which forbid the indulgence of him just as if he has forbidden by to him by the Torah. Thus the sages say his vows fosters abstinence. If on the other hand he feels he is capable of controlling himself, it is better to abstain from indulgence without formality of a vow. Regarding this regarding this, the sages just say, Sanctify yourself with which that are permitted. Okay, so um, again, there are category, three categories of the commandments, the things that you shall not, you shall do, you shall, you're permitted to do, the things that you, shall, you, you are not permitted to do, and the things that you may 
participate in in your life. So, uh, let's go to chapter 31, the war with the Midian. And it's interesting here, the Lord said to Moses, avenge the children of Israel of the Midianites. Afterwards, thou shalt be gathered unto my people. So, uh, so there's some insights here because uh, Hashem is take, telling the children of Israel to revenge, to avenge um, Israel for the sin of the Midianites. In the battles against Sikon and Og, Moses played an active role. In the previous chapter, you'll see there that he participated here. However, he merely prepares the people for the war while Pincus led them to battle. This is because God commanded the, Jew the Jewish people to take vengeance against the Midian for enticing them to idolatry of Baal Peor. No Midianite territory was captured or annexed to the land of Israel, as we mentioned previously. The idolatry of Peor is essentially heathenism. Uh, so here it says here, remember Peor, Peor the, the, the idol Peor represents heathenism. We need to emulate both Moses and Pinaeus. From Moses we learn to cultivate, cultivate the proper Jewish attitude towards materialism and its sensuality, but from Peneas, we learn to attack it, its effect on us with a righteous indignation. The word Midian in Hebrew means for strife or argument. So now we are learning another aspect of the Midians. The, Midian, the Midianites represent strife being argumentative. Remember, we are all in the middle of the 17th the three weeks, which, which is the 17th of Tammuz to the 9th of Ab, the three weeks leading to the destruction of the temple. So why was the temple destroyed? The temple was destroyed for baseless hatred or hatred with no cause. The evil baseless hatred had to be eliminated before we can enter the land of Israel. Since baseless hatred is obviously at odds with the harmonious functioning of a society. That's the prerequisite for anything, any national goal, let, let alone that of promulgating divinity into the world. Indeed, the Jews succumbed to this evil during the era of the Second Temple. This is what brought about the Temple's destruction and their present exile. Remember, they hated Yeshua without a cause. Interesting that we see the forces of darkness today. What are they doing? Across the world through, through phony organizations, pho phony causes, like if some, you know, um, you know, somebody got shot by the police and they rally and they, 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 you know, they fund the police, they are really Marxist, anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic, racist, terrorist organization. They're interested only in what? They are interested in steering baseless hatred. You know, white against black, blacks against white, um, black against Asian, Asians against white. So it's all baseless hatred. The goal is to steer baseless hatred, not to end racism. This is the war we are fighting. And the root of baseless hatred is ego. Think about it. A racist person is based on ego. An egocentric person feels threatened by anyone who opposes or seems to oppose his inflamed sense of self. Any positive quality shown by another person diminishes his own importance. So the egocentric person will dis desperately seek to delegit delegitimize the other person. Although he may not seek to actively harm him, he will secretly be pleased when the other person suffers or will at least not be troubled by his suffering. So, so you see here what's happening, you know, the, 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 you know, uh, the, 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 the root cause is really, they're trying to, 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 uh, to steer baseless hatred in our society against one another. In contrast, someone who is not plagued with egocentricities focuses only on the other person's qualities. Their sufferings will generally trouble him since he will judge them favorably and find no justification for their suffering. 
If he does find fault with someone else, he will admonish him according to the Torah's guidelines, but he will not hate him. So it's important. It's important to understand all these uh, uh, spiritual concepts. Now, in the next slide, it says here that that uh, Moses sent them a thousand every tribe of, uh, to the war. So twelve thousand men, one thousand for every tribe. Uh, and Phineas, son of Eleazar, the priest, to the war with the holy vessels and the trumpets and the alarm in his hand. So, uh, again, Moses spoke. Um, Moses um, sent Phineas. Phineas is, is, is in a unique position because there's a messianic implication here. Phineas, as you know, was the priest anointed for war. So armies of Israel is a holy army led by a general but also a priest anointed for war who would anoint the people, pray a blessing over them, lead them into battle. The priest that led them to the battle is like the is, is like a messianic figure. And that is also how it is described in many rabbinic literature. So the precedent here is in the second coming of the Mashiach, the king priest will be leading an army from heaven to strike down and avenge Hashem from the evil of Babylon. Look at Revelation chapter 19. It's here. So here, who is leading the army? So he said, And I saw a white horse. Sitting on it was one called Faithful and True. And it is righteousness that he passes judgment and goes to battle. So he is, here's the king. His eyes were like a fiery frame, frame, flame, and his head were many royal crowns and he had, he, had, he had a name written which no one knew but himself he was wearing a robe that has been soaked in blood and the name which is called the word of god so here we see this is the messiah this, this is yeshua returning with his armies the armies of heaven clothed in fine linen white and pure were following him with white horses verse 15 and out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule with a staff of iron. Verse 16. And on his robe and on his thigh, he was, a, he was a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So we see here again, you know, uh, Peneas leading the children of Israel in battle. And you see Yeshua leading his, the, 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 the armies of heaven in battle. We're going to move into, uh, uh, again, uh, chapter 8 here, uh, until chapter 31, verse 8. And it says here, verse 7, we start from 7. They warred against the Midianite, the Midian, as the Lord commanded Moses, and they slew every male. And they slew the kings of Midian, the rest of their slain, the five kings, Ebi, Rechem, Zur, Hur, Reba, and the five kings of Midian. And Balaam, look at here. Balaam also, the son of Beor, they slew with a sword. So what's interesting about that, so Balaam died by the sword. Balaam died by, by the, in the hands of Israel. There is no such thing as a messianic Gentile prophet. Notice, notice who Balaam was fighting against. He was fighting against Israel, Hashem's chosen people. If he was truly a prophet of Hashem, he will not be in the side of the enemies. In this case, you can clearly see that Balaam was a false prophet, and Balaam's spirit will, uh, and the Balaam spirit will get you in the wrong side of the battle. So, what is the Balaam spirit? So, from last few weeks ago, he says that what is the Balaam spirit? Is knowing the word, knowing the scriptures. Knowing the Torah, these are synonymous terms. The word, scriptures, and Torah are one and the same. Yet refusing to turn from our pagan ways and follow the path of truth. Let me repeat that again. Is knowing the word, the scriptures, the Torah, and yet refusing to turn from our pagan ways and follow the path of truth. We will suffer the same fate as Balaam if we resist the truth and keep living the life of lies. So we need to be careful. We're living in the last of the last days. And we need to get away from Balaam. We need to get, get away from Babylon. We need to get away from the pagan, pagan religion. 
and go into the true living Torah, Yeshua, the living Torah. So um, in chapter 34, uh, it's talking God it sets borders. In Numbers chapter 34, verse 1 and 3 to 3, says, The Lord said to Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel, and say to them, When you come into the land of Canaan, that is the land that shall fall unto your inheritance upon the land of Canaan with the coast thereof, verse 3, then your south quarter shall be the shall be from uh, from the wilderness of Sin along the coast of Edom, and the south border shall be the outermost coast of the sea, the salt seas eastward. So, God establishes borders. Why why is border so important? God has set boundaries for the land of Israel from the north, from the south, from the east, and from the west. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, 32, it says that before there were children of Israel, God already set boundaries for the nations. Notice the Lord's portion out of the land mass of the earth is Israel, a desert land, wilderness, but God kept the land, the nation, as the apple of God's eye. So God could have chosen any one of these land, but God chose this tiny piece of land right here. What does that mean? What is God telling us? God doesn't want us to destroy the ancient boundaries, barriers, or move it. But today, what is man doing? Man has been pushing the boundaries, has been wrecking the walls. Uh, for example, there's no more boundaries between the marriage institution. It is supposed to be marriages between a man and a woman. Now, they've broken that boundary and say, no, you know, we, you know, we can marry men and men or women and women. Or sometimes now they, they allow even animals. And today what is, what is considered biblically right is now worldly wrong. They say it's wrong now. It's wrong. This is wrong. And uh, and uh, and and this is now right. So we have we have we have broken, we have breached, we have destroyed the boundaries. Today, um, a lot of people are confused. Why? Because there there's so much there's so much lies being pro propagated. It says you, if you hear lies so much, then it's all of a sudden. As you hear it more and more, the lies, it becomes the truth. And that's uh, the power of the media today. Social media has, has twisted uh, the truth to a lie. So it's very important that we go back to the ancient document. We need to go back to the Word of God. We need to go back to Scripture. We need to go back. To Torah, Torah, Scripture, the Word of God. It's all the same. And when we when we move away from that and we try to change that and we try, try to try to enforce our lifestyle to the Word of God, then uh, that's where mankind gets into a lot of trouble. So in the uh, Torah portion, Masay journeys. It's interesting because such, if you read the entire journey, the 42 journeys that are mentioned, there are three um, specific events that are specifically mentioned. And these are Numbers chapter 30, verse 9, talking about the second water crisis, and then also the death of Aaron, and finally the battle of the king of Canaan. So, so the question is, it seems like the narration is not is not mentioning key events along the journey as you would expect if someone was writing about a travel journal. The question is why of all the events that happened to them for 40 years with only uh we they only noted the Torah only notes the three events are these random left out like a are these random and, and they left out the incident of the golden calf, the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai? How about the incident of the spies? He mentions three events, and as noted, the water crisis, 
the death of Aaron, and finally the battle of the king of Canaan in Harar. So why is that? So let's look at the significance of these three events that are mentioned in the the journey in the in the Torah portion. Must say so in the in the second water crisis. What happened in the second water crisis? What is the spiritual significance? So it says here, and they and they peach and they journeyed from Alush and peach in Rephadim. There was no water for the people to drink. So if you go back to the original story in Exodus chapter 17, verse 7, it says here, the name of the place was called Masa and Mariba because the of the striving of the children of Israel, because they tried the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? So here, what happened is, from the, for the first time, uh, well, uh, the spiritual significance is because there, are, there was no, there was a water crisis that Israel asked. Yes, He delivered us from slavery. Yes, indeed, they knew that, but they did not know if God is really among them. So in here is where God revealed to the children of Israel, yes, God showed them, I am with you even in your desert moments of your life. So so here, um, are you questioning if Hashem is with you in your hard times? And Hashem is telling you and I, He is. He is always there with us and for us. The second uh, story is the story of Aaron's death. So the death of Aaron uh, uh, at Mount Hor, Aaron dies in Av 9. So by the way, it's Rosh Kodesh today. It's Rosh Kodesh, July 9th. Um, and uh, on the, in Av, na, Av 1, the first day of Av, Aaron dies. What is the significance of Aaron's death? So in verse 29, uh, chapter, no, Numbers chapter 20, verse 29, and, and when all the congregation saw that Aaron was dead, they wept for Aaron for 30 days, even all the house of Israel. So so what happened here? So number chapter 20, Moses and Aaron had been like a God to them. When the people saw that Aaron died, they realized that it was God all along was the source of all their miracles, all their provisions, all the power and the signs and wonders that they saw. And not Moses and Aaron, for they were just human beings. So here, the the death of Aaron really um, drove home to them that you know the real who was who was really the power behind all that. It was not Aaron or Moses. It's not by their rod, by their hand, but by the hand of Hashem. And finally, in the battle of the Canaanites. You can see here in Numbers chapter 33, verse 40, it mentioned that the Canaanites, the king of Arad, who dwelt in the south in the land of Canaan, heard the coming of the children of Israel. In Numbers chapter 21, that is where the battle of the Canaanites is recorded. And the Canaanite, the king of Arab, who dwelt in the south, heard tell that, that, that Israel came by the way of Art. Art, Art Arterim, and he fought against Israel and took some of them captive. <clears throat> and here, verse 2, And Israel vowed a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed deliver this people unto my hand, then I will utterly destroy their city. So what happened? What happened in the battle of the Canaanite? For the first time, Israel, instead of turning to Moses, they turned to God and made a vow. If you deliver us, we will destroy their city. So it's groundbreaking. For Israel, they're, as they are approaching uh, to enter, about to enter the promised land, they have learned to approach God directly. Finally, realizing God has always been their leader, protector, and provider. Aaron's mortality teaches them that, that lesson. As we end the book, we see the physical, the physicality and spirituality of Israel is ready to enter the promised land so so us today as we near the return of yeshua are we ready to call on him are we ready to listen to obey his voice and not your priest your bishop your pope your rabbi are you ready to meet 
him too when he returns. So in um, Numbers chapter, um, I guess it's Numbers 33, the stages or the journeys of children of Israel in which they went forth out of the land of Egypt. Um, it's important to understand that this Torah portion, the Torah goes through 42 journeys from Egypt till they got to the Jordan River, as I read earlier. Interesting, those journeys, not all of them were very, were really such positive experiences. During those journeys, the Jews did something that were not really meant to, they were, they were really meant to do. In other words, we messed up. The way Rashi explains it, the reason the Torah explains all the journey is it's, it's like an analogy where a father tells his child who was sick after he gets well, remember I took you to the doctor. We set up, you know, um, we set up from home and in this journey you did not feel very good. Other journey we stopped somewhere and had ice cream and in some we stopped and had a good night's sleep. Next place, you got healed or you got better. So what Rashi is saying is, Rashi is putting an analogy to tell us that when you are in a journey with your father, you have to realize you are in a journey with your father. Even in those unpleasant parts, you are not alone. Even if you did not live up to the expectation of your father, you are still with your father. A Jew, a Jew can sometimes turn around and say, I know you were with me when I was doing right, honoring my mother and father, being benevolent, keeping the Shabbat. I know for sure you were with me. But when I messed up in those dark times, I don't know if you were with me. In this week's store portion, the way Rashi gives this analogy, Hashem is saying, no, no, no. All the 42 journeys, it was like a father taking his child. Maybe in some places, the child did not feel well, got sick, and things did not go so well. But don't ever make a mistake to think that your father is not with you. So our father in heaven is always with us. So it behooves us to take every journey as all uh, uh, to take every journey as all of our lives are made up of, of journeys. Take that journey, recognize that Hashem is holding us by his hands and know when he is lifting us up, carrying us in this cloud of glory. <clears throat> every journey has sometimes positive things, sometimes we make mistakes and we learn. Sometimes we feel remorseful so we can do better next time. Sometimes it is, uh, it is there to lift us up. But the bottom line is God is always with us. The Father is always here. They are holding us, taking us. Let us be a little more mindful of our Father. If we do that, we will be we will be a much better chill child we will cause a lot of good in our, in the world and if we do that it will give a lot more satisfaction pride and joy to our heavenly father wow whatever you're doing right now whatever you, what you are experiencing understand that you are in a journey whatever your circumstances may be we know that hashem is with you you will, he will never forsake you. Come to Him, repent, and ask Him to lift you up from the miry clay that you are, and He will. Amen. Amen. So we are ending the book of Numbers, Bar Midbar. And um, as we finish a Torah, a Torah book, uh, Kasak, we, we declare this... Uh, Declaration of faith. Kasak has many meanings. It means to be attached to something. It means to support. It means to preserve, to hold fast, to be strong.
to be strengthened, to be courageous, to retain, keep, and grab hold of, to encourage, to and to prove helpful. So when we make the declaration today, tonight, today, we are saying to God, number one, we will attach to what we have heard or and read in scriptures. We will retain and keep the words we heard and read. We will let the Holy Word strengthen us and preserve us and support our lives. And we are we are saying because the word of the Torah we will be in, we will be courageous for they are part of our lives. And finally we are saying we will study scripture with purpose in our lives. King David said, "You make known to me that the paths of life Talking about Yeshua, the living Torah. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand, i.e. with a fire no, fire of knowledge at his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Psalm, 100, Psalm 16, verse 11. So today we declare, we shout together, Kasak, Kasak, Veni Kasek. Be strong, be strong, and may you be strengthened. Amen. Amen. So to conclude today, we are called by God to be His covenant people, grafted into the commonwealth of Israel, to be holy people, to be with the holy words. Our life here on earth is a journey of faith with our Heavenly Father. We need to be more mindful that He is there with us in our peaks and valleys. Are you ready for your fresh start. Let us pray. Elvino Melcano, our Father, our King, I thank you for my brothers and sisters who are faithfully learning your Torah, learning. We are here to, to learn, to, to grow, to follow the path of truth because Yeshua is the living Torah. And Father, I just uh, pray for Courage, you said, you know, the, this, this word will, will strengthen us, will give us courage, courage to walk to the path of truth. It's not easy. I know it's not easy. But the first step is the hardest. But once you are ready to commit to following the ways of Hashem, there's no turning back. And I pray that you will give courage to my brothers and sisters in this coming, in the last of the last days. That we will, we will turn away from Balaam, the spirit of Balaam. We'll turn away from Babylon. We'll turn away from the pagan religion. We'll turn away from, from the religion that teaches the Torah is done away with. Pray that we will, we will, we will that the people will be enlightened. May they see the, the light, the truth. The deception of the enemy, and we pray that you will you will mark your people today, that you will preserve them and keep them under your wings. We ask in Yeshua the Messiah. I pray for my brothers and sisters that are going through whatever sickness, uh, whether it's a physical sickness or whatever they're going through uh, financial difficulties or their loss of loved ones, or uh, challenges in their marriages. Father, we thank you because you are the answer and we just pray for every person and every family right now in the name of Yeshua. I declare blessing. I, I declare this month of Av will be a supernatural power. The supernatural power. May the supernatural power of Hashem engulf your lives and your families and whatever circumstances you are facing right now. And may you receive your miracle today. In the name of Yeshua, you receive your miracle in the month of Av. I release your the miracle and your and the reversals of fortune. This is the the the, the month of judgment and decision, the right decision. People will make the right decisions in their life as they will listen to the voice of Hashem and not the voice of the enemy. I, I speak that and declare that in our lives of our my brothers and sisters in Yeshua the Messiah. Everybody said. Amen. And the Lord told Moses to tell Aaron to bless and mark the people. And so are you blessed and marked today. Isaiah <speaking in Hebrew>
V'yasem leka shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord let his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Peace in the name of Yeshua, our Shar Shalom, our Prince of Peace. Amen. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. And uh, Rosh Kodesh Av. Shabbat Shalom. Amen.